Good morning. Welcome to worship on this cool August day. I believe it is supposed to warm up later, but for right now, we are enjoying a cool morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being on Zoom with us, those of you who are at home. This is the time when we share announcements. Are there friends in the room who have announcements to share? Are there friends on Zoom who have announcements to share? Oh, wait. Good morning. If you go into Fellowship Bowl this morning, you notice we have some very fresh vegetables. Please help yourself. Thank you. I know you might think it's a tad early, but being prepared is a very good thing. There is a, there's a sign-up sheet for Homecoming Sunday. Um, since today is the last Sunday we'll see each other in August, I would appreciate it if everybody could sign up because I really don't want to chase people down during the focus service. Thank you. Just bring to attention the note on the back there, the choir and some guests are going to be having a concert outside on the front steps on Saturday evening. It should be fun, come join us. Two other important announcements also um, in the bulletin, one right above the one that uh, Barb just mentioned, we start our new pattern of worship in September and we're using um, a theme called Come to the Table. Part of the way that this theme is set up is that we need multiple scripture readers every week. This, uh, the blurb says that there's a sign-up sheet in Fellowship Hall. That's apparently not true. I can't find that sign-up sheet, so I don't think it's there. But um, if you're willing to read scripture, on one of the Sundays in September, starting September 10th, um, or serve as lay leader. You could write your name on a piece of paper and give it to me with a date, or you could call Dorothy um, on Monday or Tuesday and let her know, and we will get that sign-up sheet made, but you will get first dibs. Um, and the other uh, announcement is in the form of this very long two-sided form inside your bulletin. This is about the civil rights pilgrimage, which is happening in February. Those of us who are working on planning this are getting very excited about it. So I invite you to read this, to prayerfully consider whether this opportunity is for you. And if it's not for you, um, to consider whether, how you can support it with prayers or affirmation or uh, finances. Let us worship together.
Good morning, church. It looks like I arrived right on time. Um, it is wonderful to be here and to see you all. For gathering announcements, correct? Oh, okay. God is gracious and merciful. God upholds all who are falling. God is just in all her ways, kind in all his deeds. Let us worship God together. The opening hymn is number 39, Great is Thy Faithfulness. You may be seated. Let us pray. Holy One, you have created us with beauty and purpose. Together we form a kaleidoscope with many colors and many shapes, with fragments that focus and focus again in different patterns as we turn to the light of your presence. Help us to love the patterns and the turning and to trust in the beauty of the wholeness that we may rarely see. We are people in need of guidance, 
in need of peace, in need of healing, being formed and reformed. We have come, God, to put ourselves once more into your hands. We ask that you would be intimately and powerfully present as we worship you. For we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us, our Father and Mother who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So I don't have children to talk to today. So I'm going to talk to the rest of us about children. It is, uh, we, we are not actually going to read that, so we can skip that slide. Um, I went to buy school supplies to donate to the uh, Focus school supply drive. And I haven't personally bought school supplies in a number of years, and I was really astounded at how expensive they are. And um, then a couple nights later, I saw a story in the news about how expensive school supplies are, so I decided it wasn't just my, um, my point of view. And um, so I just, I just mentioned that because we have students going back to school um, in Albany in the next month but we have students going back to school today. Um, our college students are heading back today and this week. Um, so Cassandra, thank you for representing all of, all of our college students. <laughs> um, and as we think about that, I just, I just want us to think about what parents are dealing with in paying for school supplies and uh, what teachers are dealing with the fatigue of, of this job that is not always uh, appreciated, the attack on truth-telling and the whitewashing of history that is happening. There are um, children right now, families of asylum seekers who will be entering Albany schools and area schools in just a few weeks. There are people coming from so many different um, places and settings, and what we all need is kindness and growth and learning opportunities. So um, if, I had, if there had been children here to talk to, I might have said those words in a little bit different form, but that's essentially what I was gonna say. And also, um, for you, Cassandra, I have one school supply, which is an eraser. <laughs> I invite the choir to sing our anthem. Stop, never gonna stop, 
Lifting up my hands to you, lifting up my heart. When the last day comes and goes, I will be no more. I'll be praising you. No, I'll never let it end. Just begin to call again. Shouts of thankfulness and love to always run away. I will be reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Okay. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to the heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Amen. Him is until all are fed.
Let us pray together. Holy God, you are ever present and yet mysterious. You are deep love, powerful spirit, and the great unknown. We give thanks that you are here with us and in us. We find you in those who listen to our loneliness and celebrate our happiness. We meet you when we share the anxious moments and triumphant moments of others. We celebrate today with Karen Kendall and her family 80 good years. We give thanks for Karen and what she means to all of us. God, we seek your blessing on the people of this world. Tear us away from all that avoids the truth and thereby adds to misery. Gather us in towards your light and love and peace. We pray for so many who are suffering this week. For the deep, wrenching grief of Lahaina. For those in danger from fires in Canada and Spain. For those right now in the path of the storm in Mexico and California. We pray for students and educators returning to school soon. We pray that everyone might learn and grow with kindness and safety. We pray for those near and dear to us whom we have named. We give thanks for the life of Joseph Towns and Lillian Matejcik and Howard Hubbard. And we pray for all the complicated emotions that are raised by these deaths and for those who are grieving. We ask for traveling mercies for Ruth and Ellen and the boys. We ask for deep healing for James in a treatment facility, and for Emily, and for Michael. We pray for Spider as he looks for a permanent place to live, for Josephine with pneumonia, for John, in the hospital, for his family, for Leanne. We pray for Gabriel at the end of his life, for those who are caring for him, for those who love him. We seek wisdom in the midst of confusion, healing in the midst of pain, love in the midst of anger. Empower us, God, for the work that you call us to do. Equip us with saints who will say yes to your will and yes to your way. Equip us, God, to journey with Jesus through uncertainty. Equip us, God, to speak the truth in love, even when it's uncomfortable. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.
Jesus wants to be alone. So he goes to a lonely place. He wants to be alone because he has just heard the news that King Herod has killed John the Baptist. John is dead. Herod is under the impression that Jesus is John the Baptist reincarnated, which means that what happened to John could easily now happen to Jesus. It is heartbreaking, terrifying news, and Jesus just wants to be alone for a while. Herod Antipas imprisoned John for speaking the truth about Herod's own immorality after Herod divorced his first wife and unlawfully took his sister-in-law as his second wife. Herod did not appreciate the bad publicity that John was giving him. Putting John in prison was bad enough, but now Herod has casually, callously beheaded John at the request of his stepdaughter who was dancing at a party. Jesus is hurting. He is baffled. He is seriously disappointed with God. How could God let evil win like that? John was his servant, and now he's dead. But Jesus is not the only one distressed by this terrible news. The crowd goes out to Jesus because they are afraid and angry and discouraged and heartbroken. They are sick in body and soul, and Jesus doesn't get to be alone because the people need him and he has compassion on them. At an earlier time in his life, in an event also connected with John the Baptist, Jesus had also sought a lonely place. It was right after his baptism which, Jesus, which John performed, remember? As Jesus came up from the water, the voice from heaven had pronounced him beloved. And from there, he had immediately spent 40 days alone, all alone except for the voice of the tempter. And that place where he went to be alone after his baptism is described with the Greek word aramus. Aramus. Aramus means a solitary place, a lonely, desolate, or uninhabited place. And right after Jesus' baptism, when he withdraws to Eremos, the word is usually translated as wilderness. And that same word is used here in today's reading, but here it's translated a deserted place. I wish the translators would be consistent so that we would recognize this place for what it is. It is the remote, uninhabited place where Moses and the people of Israel wandered for 40 years. That place where they didn't have the food that they were used to. There were no grocery stores. And so God supplied them with water and manna and quail. This is the place where the prophets escaped to save their lives when angry kings were after them. It's the place where Jesus went after his baptism and was tempted. And it's the place that Jesus seeks to be alone on the terrible day that he learns of John's death. Aramos is a lonely place. It's the place we go when we come to the end of ourselves. The place where we cannot rely upon our own resources. We don't usually go there willingly. Aremos also implies devastation and depopulation. For exiles in Babylon, a 
Aramos recall, recalls far off Jerusalem, standing empty and desolate after war. For Matthew's community, more immediately, Aramos is a Jerusalem that is battered and depopulated by the Roman armies as they crush the revolt of 70 AD. Today, Aramos is Ukraine. Today, Aramos is Lahaina. Aramos is where the disciples are, near the end of this long taxing day. Apparently, the disciples couldn't let Jesus have that alone time either. Somehow, they showed up with the crowd. And now, they want to send the crowd home, back to civilization and shelter and their own kitchens because it is dinner time. Then Jesus says, they don't need to go. You give them something to eat. This should be the out that Jesus was looking for. I thought he wanted to be alone. He has the perfect excuse to disperse thousands of people, but, he, but instead he says, they don't need to go. You give them something to eat. Jesus doesn't fix it for the disciples. He wants to figure it out with them. Evil has just won, remember? Jesus may not be too confident that God is going to come through now. He's waiting to see what will happen, just like they are. The disciples are incredulous. The idea that they can fix this is laughable. Mark's Gospel reports that it would require half a year's wages to feed the crowd. They do not have that kind of resource. We've got nothing, Jesus. Ramos is usually the place where we think we have nothing. They say they have nothing, but they do have something. They have five loaves of bread and two fish. Okay, maybe they have something, but it is definitely not enough for the thousands of hungry people. But Jesus takes it from them, blesses it, and breaks it, and gives it back to them. You give them something to eat. Barbara Brown Taylor wonders what the crowd thought about all of this. She imagines one person saying to her neighbor, what's going on up there? And the neighbor says, you're not going to believe it. That Jesus fellow just said grace over five loaves and two fish. And now some of his men are passing them out through the crowd. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. But don't get too excited. It will all be gone before it ever gets to us. All four Gospels tell this story. Matthew and Mark tell it twice. It seems to have been a favorite of the early churches. The early churches were mostly poor, marginalized, relatively powerless, sometimes persecuted communities. Maybe they told it so often because they really needed for it to be true. Maybe they felt that what they had was nothing. Or, if not nothing, then definitely not enough. But they kept remembering this story about the time when they gave their not enough to Jesus and ended up with leftovers. They kept telling this story as a reminder that sometimes it is when we have nothing to give that God can use us the most. Billy Graham said, when we come to the end of ourselves, we come to the beginning of God. In this lonely place, maybe Jesus was coming to the end of himself. He was devastated and depleted, torn up inside, 
feeling vulnerable. The disciples were distressed because Jesus was distressed and now totally aware of their own inadequacy. And then, abundance. All this happens in Aremos, wilderness. The wilderness is not what prevents us from serving. Sometimes the wilderness is what qualifies us to serve. Perhaps it is when we think we have nothing to give that God can use us the most. What do you do when you've come to Aramos? When you are at the end of your physical and spiritual resources, when you know that you are completely inadequate for the needs at hand. Parker Palmer is a Quaker author and activist who writes about spirituality and social change. Many of us have read his books. He tells one story of a personal experience of need and abundance. He writes, after a speech in Saskatoon, I boarded a 6 a.m. Air Canada flight home. Our departure was delayed because the truck that brings coffee to the planes had broken down. And after a while, the pilot said, we're going to take off without the coffee. We want to get you to Detroit on time. Palmer says, I was up front where all the road warriors sit, a surly tribe, especially at that early hour. They began griping loudly and at length about incompetence and lousy service. And once we got into the air, the lead flight attendant came to the center of the aisle with her microphone and said, good morning, we're flying to Minneapolis today at an altitude of 30 feet. <laughs> that, of course, evoked more scorn from the road warriors. Then she said, now that I have your attention, I know you're upset about the coffee. Well, get over it. Start sharing stuff with your seatmates. That bag of five peanuts you got on your last flight and put in your pocket, tear it open and pass them around. Got gum or mints? Share them. You can't read all of the sections of your paper at once. Offer them to each other. Show off the pictures of your kids and grandkids you have in your wallets. And as she went on in that vein, people began laughing and doing what she had told them to do. A surly scene turned into summer camp. An hour later, as the attendant passed his seat, Palmer signaled to her and said, what you did was really amazing. Where can I send a letter of commendation? Thanks, she said, I'll get you a form. And then she leaned down and whispered, the loaves and fishes are not dead. What do you do when you've come to Aramos, the wilderness? When you are at the end of your physical and spiritual resources, when you know that you are completely inadequate for the needs at hand. Honestly, I do not know. I am not sure. But like the early church, I keep remembering this story. The wilderness is not what prevents us from serving. Sometimes being in the wilderness is what qualifies us to serve. And perhaps it is when we think that we have nothing to give that God can use us the most. So I am taking stock of what I have, every little bit of it, and I'm offering it to God. Now, what I have in this moment is probably not enough. 
not nearly enough. But what we have together, with God's help, just might be. Amen. I invite you to rise as you are able to sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. really trying to make that tune work, Michael. <laughs> it's number 837. Oh, great. <laughs> One joy that I failed to mention at the sharing time was that I am doing a wedding this afternoon for a couple whose names are Lydia and Jonah. So uh, wherever you are at two o'clock this afternoon, um, put a smile on your face and be joyful for Lydia and Jonah. And now would you receive a benediction? May the Lord Christ go before you to prepare your way. Christ beside you be companion to you everywhere you go. Christ beneath you to strengthen and sustain you when you fall or fail. Christ behind you to finish and complete what you must leave undone. Christ within you to give you faith and courage, hope and love. But mostly Christ above bless and keep you now and evermore. Amen.